Well, welcome to Sunday morning at the Marxist Library. My name is Eugene Rule, and I will be your host and moderator for today's program, which features a Green Party activist, Laura Wells, who will speak on the problems in the American political slash electoral system, the need for an update, and the role of third parties. Laura will tell us how the United States used to be a leading democracy two centuries ago. Now many other nations have leapfrogged over the United States by developing better political electoral systems. And as a consequence, they also have better systems for healthcare, higher education, housing, and justice, combined with increased personal safety. The lockdown two-party system has joined with vast inequality of wealth and power in the United States to raise hurdles to block solutions that people want, need, and support. Laura will lead us in looking at these hurdles, many of which are now being highlighted during the presidential campaign of Cornell West, who is running as an independent third-party candidate. Uh, before I introduce Laura, let me pause and give you some background on our library and our institute. We are all in cyberspace right now in various places across the nation and around the world. But our physical and spiritual home is the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library located at 6501 Telegraph Avenue in Oakland, about a mile south of the University of California campus in Berkeley. The Institute for the Critical Study of Society was formed in 2004 as the research and educational arm of the library to further its goals of preserving the written heritage of Marx and supporting the struggle for racial and gender equality and for social socialism. Some of us are members of uh, specific parties and tendencies, others are not. So our workshops, forums, and publications do not follow any party line, nor do they represent any kind of group consensus on the issues involved. We are united, however, in our respect for the work of Karl Marx and our belief that his work will remain as important for understanding the class struggles of the future as they have been for the past. And as a group, we continue to draw inspiration from Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And our speaker today exemplifies this Marxian principle. Laura Wells has been a Green Party activist since the party became ballot qualified in California in 1992. She is a coordinator of the State Coordinating Committee of the Green Party, and she has run for state controller, governor, and for Congress. Laura Wells, both as a Green Party candidate and a behind the scene organizer, has experienced firsthand the roadblocks put up by the two titanic parties, as Laura calls them, including being arrested at the gubernatorial uh, debate in at Dominican University in San, San Rafael uh, in 2010 for the accurate charge of trespassing at a private party. And I would just like to add a personal note that I have known uh, Laura for many years. She is a, a friend and comrade, and uh, I was with her at that event in uh, in uh, San Rafael. So, um, um, so it's over to you, Laura, and it's really good to see you. Okay. Well, thank you, ICSS, and thanks everybody for being here. The uh, <laughs> we we definitely have some problems in our democracy, and so I'm going to do sort of the standard thing that I don't always do, but to say what I'm going to say and then say it and then tell you what I said. Uh, so what I want to part 
part of this presentation is going to be what can we do about it? And I'm also going to tell some stories about various candidates that will demonstrate sort of what our system is now and then um, have a recipe for a better democracy. The things that there are some things that uh, people who aren't particularly political believe that we should do, and there are some things that we actually should do. Uh, and all of this, of course, is in my opinion. Uh, so what is a political party? I'll just start with that. Um, is As people probably know, it wasn't talked about in the Constitution and all of that. But the various states, of which we have 50, <laughs> all have different um, standards and all of whether they have parties, whether you register in party or not. And by the way, every county has a different electoral system. You know, some of them change, but there are 58 counties in California and they all do things differently. And that huge complication, I think, is part of the design to pe keep people confused. If you talk to people on the street, they don't necessarily know, for example, in California, what party they're registered in. And a lot of people don't really want to register because they don't want to do jury duty and they don't see it as useful for much more than that. But in California, for example, there are six ballot qualified uh, political parties. There might be another, uh, another one, but the basics are the Democrats and the Republicans. And then there's the Green Party and the Libertarians and the Peace and Freedom Party and something that's called either the American Independent Party that a lot of people mistake as being independent and they register for that, whereas it's the party that was started as an anti-integration party uh, with George Wallace decades ago. And, and there's the... Um, I think I mentioned them all, peace and freedom and the, you know, the Constitution, also known as the American Independent Party. To become a political party and to stay a political party is a complicated affair, especially when you look across the nation. Uh, uh, but I wanted to say that some, some parties that are thought of as parties like the Tea Party that really hit a peak in 2010, and I know that because that was the year that I ran for governor as a Green Party candidate and got arrested. But the Tea Party was strong then, but it was never a political party. It was just um, called that. The People's Party is, I think it's uh, on the ballot in, I've heard various opinions, one, one, two or three states. So, but for a long time, it wasn't, it was called a political, you know, People's Party, but it wasn't necessarily a political party. Now, there, um, so I want to give my personal opinion that there is no reason to stay a, red, a re registered voter in one of the two Titanic parties, the parties that promise you all sorts of things and then run straight into the iceberg and their leaders do not turn aside um, and say, let's say a reason to become a registered Democrat. And I'll and I said that carefully to maintain, you know, to stay a registered Democrat because sometimes people want to get in there and affect the primary. And uh, looking at Bernie Sanders in the state of California, for example, you can be no party preference, which, by the way, they keep changing the name of that, you know, just to keep things complicated. So it's now it's no party preference and you could vote in the Democratic primary, but they encouraged everybody. No, no, no. What you should do is you should register Democrat, register Democrat to make sure that you are able to vote for Bernie Sanders in the primary. So people registered Democrat with the idea that they would deregister later. The thing is that people don't have on the top of their to do list dealing with their voter registration and the Democratic Party apparatus knows that. And so then what happens is that it strengthens the two party system and weakens the possibility of other alternatives. But so some people did register for a month or two, vote for Bernie Sanders or whoever the 
um, some would call them sheepdog candidates, uh, was, you know, were at, for that particular presidential election. And then some, you know, registered back. But to register Green Party or Peace and Freedom, again, I'm talking California, and I know that there are people in other uh, states on the call, but to register Green Party or Peace and Freedom is a strong thing to do as opposed to being no party preference. You know, it's something that will make the case not just that I'm mad at what's happening. I don't like what's happening. That's a good case to make. But a better case is this is what I want. You know, the 10 key values of the Green Party and the, and, uh, the peace and freedom are very, very close uh, in values and uh and and we've been working together lately. We had a left unity slate where we uh, made the effort to run candidates not in competition with each other for the statewide offices in 2022. And that was uh, that that was successful. One of the things that happened was that I think it increased the voter, you know, the votes that we got. And it increased the endorsements. People were so, people like the idea of unity. Unfortunately, the way that usually is applied is unity between the two big parties. You know, they want the Democrats and the Republicans to have more unity, less polarization, less of the opposite. And then you have people who, who say, well, what's the difference between the two of them? And to me, there is a difference. Um, and I, the way that I think about it is big circle. Like you have half and divide the circle in half. And at the top um, are things like Wall Street and war, corporations. Those things, they're pretty close when you, maybe their words are a little different, but you know, Wall Street is uh, gives to both sides. The war weapons industry gives to both sides. They talk a little differently though. And at the bottom of this half, they are not unified. And those are the things that the government has no business determining whom we love and what our family structures are and things like that. And whether or not we decide to stay pregnant or not, you know, that those things, they are um, all the, the isms and all of that. Uh, that those are the things that are really none of the government's business those things they disagree about. And so then they they push people apart on those things. And then, and then there seems to be this process of where then people want to line up with the other things, you know, because that's their team. And then they want to be on, on the side of their team. And so those, the, that um, unity thing uh, is a false goal that people want to, to Obama, you know, well, Obama was trying to reach across the aisle. No, the aisle is not in Washington. The aisle is between Washington and the rest of the country. That's the aisle that we needed somebody like Obama to, uh, or any president to reach across. So that's, um, now, and in, in, in case that, in case anybody thinks that the Democratic Party is a whole lot better than the Republican Party, which in some ways it is, um, but look at California. California has what's called a super trifecta, which means it has three elements. One, it has a Democratic governor. Two, it has super majorities in both, two and three, super majorities in both houses of the legislature. And they have had that for about a decade. What happened at the beginning of 2022, about a year and a half ago, was that there were health care bills. Two of them. As a matter of fact, often they've said, well, you know, we have a health care bill, but we don't have the bill to fund it. This time there was the bill to implement it and the bill to fund it. Also, the other elements were, I told you, the super trifecta. There were no dem. You could not blame the Republican Party. They uh, there was a budget surplus. They they have 
the governor and so many other people had campaigned on how important health care, single payer health care even was to the country. They uh, had said that, you know, it's the only thing that makes sense. That's the kind of thing that Obama has said, the kind of thing that Governor Gavin Newsom has said. There was popular support. Finally, people have gotten beyond the it's socialized medicine that they said decades ago. Um, also, they had, and every other wealthy industrialized country has it. Obamacare improved health care in a bunch of ways in the United States. And he still, when Barack Obama was elected, had 60% in both houses, filibuster proof still gave us the worst healthcare system of all the wealthy industrialized countries. With all of that, without being able to blame uh, the other party. Uh, and they had put it on the desk of Schwarzenegger. He was, he was governor from like 2003 to 2010. They put it on his desk twice because he had vowed he would, uh, he would uh, veto it. And he did. But they, but Jerry Brown then was governor for eight years, never put it on his desk. Gavin Newsom, now he's been governor for, uh, when did he start? 2010, 20, you know, so he's been governor for a little while and they haven't put it on his desk. And at the beginning of 22, we were still in the middle of a pandemic. If there's any time that you need to take care of health care, that would be it. So they had a budget su surplus, a super trifecta. They had campaigned on it. They had a bill to implement and a bill to, to finance. They had popular support. Every other country has had it. They've, we've got plenty of examples. And they would not even take it out of committee to put it to the legislature as a vote so that they couldn't even put it on the governor's desk. And the... Um, and you couldn't tell whether your representative voted for it or against it. That is how the um, current party is uh, working. And you can go down the list. Healthcare is a big one. There's housing. There's higher education that, again, other wealthy industrialized countries and some countries that aren't wealthy allow their students who do all the, you know, who do the hard work of being a student and studying and, and being qualified to not be in debt, you know, to when they get out of, uh, out of the university, if they were lucky enough to go to college in the first place. There's also the justice system. There are so many ways that we could, that this wealthiest country the world has ever known lags behind other um, countries and the political electoral system has a lot to do with that. Now, one of the things that happens um, in, I, I think I'll say at this point, what, what the successes that we have had, and by we, I'm gonna talk about the Green Party and the Peace and Freedom Party. And that is that we've been, um, we have survived there is a system out there that is actually trying to kill us and has been in the case of Peace and Freedom Party became ballot qualified in 1967. And so that was what, 56 years ago. And the uh, the Green Party was 1992. So that was over 30 years ago. We have, so the Green Party is international. That's one of the reasons that it's hard to kill us, that that gives us some staying power. And we're national. At the peak, I think one of Jill Stein's runs for president, we had 48 states, I think, that they could, um, that people could vote for Jill Stein for president so that we were on, she was on the ballot or you could write her in. She was on the ballot, I think, in at least 45 states, maybe more. And you could write her in in some other states. In some other states, the door was completely closed. So being national and decentralized, that there is no grand uh, puba, you know, there is no top leader. And when you when that's the case, actually, it's harder for them to pick you off. It's a little harder to organize internally, um, and it's harder to move on a dime, particularly in the um, Green Party. 
because of the decentralization, but it it's actually a factor that helps us survive, I believe. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, cooperating, as I was mentioning about the left unity slate, and we will continue to do that, uh, build on that success. Uh, and people know that the third parties are the ones that have uh, advanced important uh, issues in our country, like abolition, like women's suffrage, like the 40 hour work week, like, uh, you know, uh, marriage equality, like legalization of cannabis, you know, like all of those things come in with the uh, progressive alternative independent parties and then later get adopted. And when they start out, it seems like they're never going to get adopted. And then they do. Um, and so also we've been like, I, I think the Green Party is probably the most progressive, pro successful progressive think tank in nationally because we put things out and then they get, uh, you know, like the Green New Deal, which actually Howie Hawkins was the first person to put that um, phrase together. And the uh, AOC, Alexandria um, Ocasio-Cortez, dumbed it down, unfortunately, and it didn't still didn't go anywhere. And by dumbed it down, it reduced it by taking out um, the one of the huge problems that this country has, military spending. You know, we could have these other things if we didn't spend as much on our military as the nine or 10 other countries in the world spend, in, which include Russia and China and all these other countries. Um, we could have those things, and that was not in the Green New Deal. The worst thing for the environment, war. Can you come up with a worse thing for the environment? So there are some successes that we have had, even though they've been trying to kill us. So I'm going to talk about some candidate examples. One of the uh, things that you hear a lot is, or at least I've heard it a lot, is they say Greens take, we've all heard it, Greens take votes away from the Democrats. Greens, the Green Party is a spoiler to the Democratic Party. Ralph Nader spoiled the 2000 election. There are so many reasons why that is so wrong. Um, um, but I, I'm not sure I know personally of anybody who's been convinced when they when they thought that he spoiled it, that they've been convinced that he didn't by any kind of facts that came across their minds. Um, but that is used as a way to try to get us to shut up and sit in our corner and not not um, not challenge their um, dominion over us. I know for a fact that Democrats take votes away from the Greens. They take votes away from the Greens and Peace and Freedom Party and every other, uh, you know, socialist alternative, you know, every party that um, exists. They people want to vote for the Greens because of their values or because of they they know the people because of the no corporate money, you know, that we don't take corporate money. You take corporate money. Person who pays you is essentially your boss. You know, the Wall Street and war pay for the Democrats, pay for the Republicans. Gee, why did Obama do those things? Why didn't he um, give us a better health care? Why did he eliminate the public option? Because that would have been too much competition for the people who were funding his campaign and the entire Democratic Party, as well as the Republican Party. Now we have had now and and not only do they take vote, votes away, but they take candidates away. We've had at one point San Francisco had six elected Greens in the uh, the the Board of Supervisors because it's the city and county of San Francisco, and the Board of Education. They had five or six Greens, and all but one switched to Democrat. Why? Because the system is that if you want to get the endorsements, even of the unions 
that are not being um, helped by the Democratic Party, even by the Sierra Club and Planned Parenthood and all of these organizations, which we are solidly, our values are solidly in support of those uh, things. And the Democrats are, are sometimes verbally in support of them, but not in terms of actions. And, and when the Greens get elected, and I don't know how many Greens have gotten elected all together. I know at various times we've had 160 across the country. We've had 60 in the state and all that. They get in, in office and start balancing the budget as well as providing for housing. Richmond Progressive Alliance, the city of Richmond, which is a city north of, uh, it's in the East Bay, but north of San Francisco, uh, reduced crime and, and increased, uh, you know, the, the policing, increased the community policing and reduced crime and got Chevron to pay a, more of its fair share of taxes and improved the lives of the of the citizens of, of Richmond and provided an example beyond that. So Gail McLaughlin is one of the people that I'll talk about. And she was she was elected as a Green to the Richmond uh, City Council in 2004, and then mayor in 2006. She was the mayor of the largest city in the country with a Green Party mayor. And then she was term limited in after eight years and, and was a member of the council again. And then she switched to no party preference in order to run for the lieutenant governor, because there's the idea that you'll get more um, media and uh, more endorsements if you're not green. Uh, and then she went back to the city council um, I don't think that worked out all that well, being no party preference running for lieutenant governor because they know what you stand for. And uh, then she went back and, she, and and is working with the city, is a, is a city council member in Richmond again. Kenneth Mejia ran for Congress in 2018. He's a, a young, like 30, you know, I think he was under 30. And he ran for Congress. He was one of three people who ran head to head with an incumbent Democrat, Democratic uh, Congress person in 2018. Uh, the, another one was also in Southern California, Rodolfo Cortez Berrigan. And I think he switched to being peace and freedom. I'm not sure what his current status is. And then there was Laura Wells. I I ran um uh, the hardest campaign I've run and because I ran against Barbara Lee and it was difficult because you'd try to hand somebody a piece of paper and they would say oh but I love Barbara Lee and they would tell me well she she's the only person that voted against the Patriot Act or she was the only person that voted against Iraq neither one of which was true uh but she was the only person who voted against uh, invading you know, Afghanistan after 9-11. She was the lone vote. That takes guts. Even if she did have Berkeley, Oakland behind her, she had the East Bay of California behind her and nobody else had as progressive a district behind them. She was the most in danger of losing her seat if she voted for it. But still, it was a courageous vote. And then people expanded that to being the lone vote on the Patriot Act and the, and the Iraq War and all that, the Iraq invasion. But um, what I realized during that one was that the very progressive, the most progressive, and Barbara Lee is arguably one of the most progressive Congress people in the country, set the upper limit of what we can actually expect. And so that if we go with the progressive caucus in Washington, for example, they are the upper limit of what we can expect. And they vowed back to health care. They would not vote for a health care 
um, system that did not have a robust public option. What did that mean? That people could choose. There'd be a competition. You know, this favorite word of um, capitalists, you know, there needs to be competition. Um, they could choose to have a Medicare style health care option. That's the public option. So it's changed from a robust public option to, well, maybe not so robust, but at least a public option. And then it was like, okay, so it's some kind of public option. And then it was no public option. And the Progressive Caucus folded and voted for it, every single person. Dennis Kucinich was a holdout. And so Obama took him up in the uh, presidential jet and convinced him that, yes, he too should show solidarity. That's their form of solidarity, selling out the whole country with a terrible health care system so, so that he would show solidarity with his political party. So, um, so, so the reason that I ran against Barbara Lee was because she was running unopposed. And in California, we have a top two primary system, which I'll bet if you polled most people, they don't even realize that in November, there are only two parties, two parties, yeah, two candidates and, and Democrats and Republicans, sometimes two Democrats, sometimes two Republicans, but rarely anybody else to choose from in November for any of the partisan offices at the state level or national level with the exception of president. Everything else is top two. So if she was running unopposed, if I ran, uh, the idea was, and, and I fell for it, uh, was that if we won the write-in, then we would be the uh, candidate on the November ballot. And so we ran, won the write-in, I was the candidate, and it was the hardest campaign I ever did. Um, but I learned a lot from it. And so if you ever think about running for office, run, because you learn a lot. Uh, so I came in actually with like 11.6%. Rodolfo ran against a, a Democratic Party incumbent for Congress, Rodolfo Cortes Bar Barragan. He got 22.6%. Kenneth Mejia got 27.5%. Um, so against a, a long, against a Democratic incumbent. And so he was like a rising star. What did he do? He switched to Democrat because he decided to run for the Los Angeles controller and he won, uh, which was great. And if he had tried to run as a Green, probably wouldn't have. I believe he's still um, uh staying with the Green Party values of no corporate money and 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 justice and peace and and grassroots democracy as well as a, as environmental. But that's where, because of the two party system, we the the alternative parties lose lose power. Rebecca Kaplan is a person who in Oakland ran as uh, a green in two thousand as an at large candidate. Uh, against Henry Chang, and she got 45%. And then later she was a, a appointed to AC Transit. And then uh, she decided to run again. She changed to Democrat. Why? So that she could get the um, endorsements. The unions say, if you run as a Green, we're not going to endorse you because it reduces your chance of winning. And if you run as a Democrat, we'll, we'll endorse you. So she ran as a Democrat and she did win. Um, and she'd gotten forty five percent as a green, but to get over the over the edge. So and then she ran. I went to one of her campaign um, gatherings, and they and you had to pay at the door. It wasn't just a like donate later. You had to pay at the door. It was interesting. They never cashed my check though, which was fine with me, because a couple of people handed me their business cards. They were all developers. You know, they they you know just talking to different people, and they say, "Oh, here, who's I'm who I'm with," and it's all developers, and developers at the city level. Developers control at the city levels, and at the state level, you can be a medium sized corporation. At the national level, you have to be a national corporation. You have to be War, Wall Street, pharmaceuticals, 
those kinds of things, that's how you, how you buy out. But at the local level, it happens too. It's mostly it's developers. Um, and so when they do infrastructure, even, you know, they do infrastructure rather than including, which is important, the potholes need to get fixed. Uh, but they do infrastructure because they can do payback contracts. Do you know, you, they don't put more money into the schools and more money. You know, what, what did Biden allow, uh, forgive $10,000 of debt? What other country has their 22 year olds in debt the moment they become, you know, adults? Uh, so rather than put money into schools, because there's no money for corporations in schools, except, you know, uh, not as much money as there are in prisons, you know, but there are contracts for, for food service and things like that. But they put money into infrastructure projects, which we need, but which also allow them to um, do payback uh, contracts for the for their campaign contributions. So that was Rebecca Kaplan. It's like, oh, this is interesting. I see a bunch of developers here. She's a Democrat. Now, uh, a great example, Kashama Swant, who was a socialist alternative. She was the first socialist to be elected in Seattle. Seattle, Washington, since 2016, Nin sorry, 1916, 1916. So she was the first person who was elected and she was elected in May of, uh, and she was elected in 2013. So it was almost a hundred years later and she won. Uh, one of the uh, things that she did was that she was part of the socialist alternative and and did what everybody always wants the can candidates to do, built and stayed with a strong social movement. So uh, the socialist alternative stayed strong. She was on a campaign for $15 an hour minimum wage, and it had an effect across the country. And within the first year it was enacted, even though nobody else ran on it, but because it was, she was at the table. That's one of the reasons that we need we need people at the table because they will bring up these things that otherwise will not be brought up. And so she was at the city council table, brought up fifteen dollars an hour, and other people, other councilors, were embarrassed to vote against it. Do you know they? So it was like they they didn't want to go on record as against it. And so whether or not they were for it to begin with, her presence at the table, and they um, empowered them to, uh, or encouraged them, pressured them, pressured them to vote for it. Then they did a, a recall. So she got like 50.7% the first time, and then she got 56 when she ran again four years later, two years, two years later in 2015. And, and then she got... Uh, 51%, she was always 50 something percent. Then they did a recall. Do you know who's in Seattle? Um, Boeing, uh, Microsoft, you know, so, so they did a recall of her. And if you have enough money, I mean, character assassination is about one of the easiest things you can do. If you wanna show some power, just go out to, to assassinate somebody's character. It's happening, you know, it, it, it happens all the time. It even happened with, Ralph Nader, you know, um, and he's the he's been uh, uh, such a monofocused public person uh, that they could even try to assassinate his character by calling him whatever an egomaniac or whatever. But he's uh, back to Ralph Nader started a bunch of his organizations. He was able to start because he sued the big three automakers for um, trying to set him up with some gorgeous female and, and get some, uh, you know, some sleaze factor on him and didn't work. And uh, he got a settlement and started things like public citizen. So that was pretty um, a cool use of corporate money. Uh, so she got recalled. This is Kashama Sawant up in Seattle, and she beat it by 50 
getting 50.38%. So there was just a difference of less than a percent that she stayed stayed in. This was in December of 2021. And then she decided that she's not going to run again in 2023. She's going to do a, a campaign of the Socialist Alternative Party, but she, of the Workers' Strike Backed to try to you know work on union un, on unionizing workers i've heard recently that it's 10% of the country i used to hear that it was 12% unionized and of course the stronger the unions are even with the the problems that there are with union leadership and all of that stuff that there have been when the base is strong the rank and file um and when unions get bigger and stronger um it affects all workers whether they're unionized or not um, <clears throat> Matt Guns, uh, can you imagine what a different uh, difference this state would be in the, in the city of California, the city of, of San Francisco, if Matt Gonzalez had won for mayor? He ran as a green. The reason he became a green was that Medea Benjamin, who was one of the co-founders of Code Pink, ran as a green for Senate against Dianne Feinstein. Dianne Feinstein refused to, to debate because, I mean, why should she? Um, it could only hurt her, you know, wouldn't help her. Um, so she refused to debate. And that was such a violation of Matt Gonzalez's standards of how things should be that he he registered green. And he said that when when he won, he got into a runoff with Gavin Newsom in San Francisco. And by the way, he was one of the greens that was in San Francisco. He was on the city council slash, you know, board of supervisors and became the president of the board. Um, he uh, was in a runoff with Gavin Newsom. And he said that one of the first things that came in was PG&E said, where do we send the check? And he said, don't bother. I'm green. We don't take corporate money. So he did not take money, you know, take money from PG&E. Why don't we have public utilities? Let me think. Could it be something about the campaign donations of, of organizations like Pacific Gas and Electric? So he got 47% in the Democratic stronghold of San Francisco. Oh, that was such a heartbreaker. And how did Gavin Newsom get go over the top? I'm sure the people that came from out of state to support this Democrat running against a Green, I don't think they've ever collected such a group of people when a Democrat was running against a Republican. But running against a Green, this was 2003. They brought in Clinton, this is Bill, Bill Clinton, Al Gore, not just those two, but Jesse Jackson, and of course, Dianne Feinstein and Nancy Pelosi to, to campaign for Gavin Newsom against the terrific threat that a, a Green Party mayor, and as Matt Gonzalez says, he said the thing they were afraid was having somebody honest, having an honest politician get elected as mayor. And so Gavin Newsom went on to become governor and people say, oh yeah, yeah, he's doing a good job. Oh, he's a presidential. I mean, he's doing, Biden is doing a good job. I've heard that so much. That's because our expectations are so low. You know, <laughs> a good job, you know, is that they, eliminate uh, what did it, somebody was telling me how good Biden was about unions and because they because they made it harder for the corporations to sh shut down the unions or something. OK, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Great. Um, now, uh, Elizabeth May is a, just a, a, an example in Canada. She was a member of parliament and, and the leader of the Green Party there. One of the things that has happened with like Kashama Sawant and Elizabeth May is that they become, they get elected as green and you think that's a crack and you go, okay, maybe this will open up. There will be more um, people will come in, but that doesn't seem to be the way they, then the resources, because the vast resources um, gather themselves up and squash, you know, like they recalled there was Chesa Bodin, I might have his name wrong. Um, they recall people, you know, like, uh, and they'll, they'll do whatever it takes, character assassination, whatever it takes to isolate 
the the person. And it, although, as I said, if there's one person at the table, it's helpful. Now, um, so those are some examples that show how the 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 way that I hope show how uh, the system fights against uh, the candidates that we do run, we being the progressive, the real progressive alternative non-corporate um, entities. Now, a recipe for, uh, for a better democracy. I'll tell you what I think are a couple of things that often uh, people think we need to do. And, and the way that I would group this is that there's some things where they really, you know, the the focus on individualism in the United States, there are individual things that people, uh, that we get focused on that are important and that distract us from the system in, as a whole that, and distract us. And, and we don't get a lot of information about the system as a whole and how it works and all of its complications. And it's kept complicated, just like the tax system and the electoral systems and all of them kept very complicated. Um, but, and I want to go back and say, remember those things like marriage equality and um, women's suffrage and things like that. Often it's, those are in the lower half of that circle, you know, like where there's unity in the above, which is war, Wall Street corporations and disunity on those things that shouldn't happen at all. Also, those things at the bottom are like individual rights. You know, it's more like that, not the system. And so people think that um, that there's an anti-corruption act that's being put out by represent us, represent.us. And somebody sent me something recently that Michael Doug Douglas, the actor, did a uh, strong piece about how we need anti-corruption act and it's something that all these people agree with and so he was talking about the problem and I was going yeah 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 that's the problem that's a problem and then what he came up with was what he what they came up with the anti-corruption act was to have independent commissions to set up the voting districts in a minute, we're going to talk about proportional representation, which is the real solution that we need and that 90 plus other countries in the world have. But independent commission to set up voting districts? No, we need multiple, uh, can we need districts that have multiple um, legislatures, uh, five people to a big district so that if you get 20% of that district, you get one of the five people is at the table, bringing up things that that the Democrats and Republicans just want us to keep our blinders on about to ignore. Um, and uh, reasonable term limits. Term limits are a con are generally conservative. Where else do you say, well, you've had too much experience. We don't want you to do that job anymore. Do you know, but term limits came out when uh, the term limits for, ter limits for president came out after FDR because they did not want somebody like they did not want the people to be able to vote in somebody like uh, FDR again. So they had term limits for that. And then some place like Venezuela tries to get rid of term limits, which a whole lot of countries do not have term limits. But then they say, oh, Hugo Chavez wants to be president forever. No, he wants to be able to be elected if the people still want him, as is the case in, I, I knew the whole list at the, at the time, but it's like the UK, maybe Italy, you know, perhaps the city council, you know, there's a whole lot of places that don't have term limits. Congress, Senate, the House of Representatives. Um, so term limits are not the solution. Um, uh, other things that's uh, not no lobbyist money. Can we generalize that? No corporate money altogether. You know, no lobbyist money, not just lobbyists. Uh, the voters would get a hundred dollars to support the candidate of their choice. Um, ranked choice voting. Talk about that in a minute. Secure automatic voter registration. Good idea. Again, that's talking about the individual. Um, vote from home. Well, we're pretty much getting that. Um, but those, what, what's missing on that is 
Proportional representation, as I just mentioned, and, and most people in the country do not know what that is. And as I said, 90 plus con countries do have it. And I see I'm about, so like I see 1124, I have just a few minutes to wrap up, which I'm working real hard to do. Um, and ranked choice voting has not produced the results that we were hoping for. And the reason I think that that is, is that people look at the list of candidates, and it has happened that the, the, the person that got the most votes in the city of Oakland, Don Parada, who was like a machine Democrat candidate, got the most votes in the first round, but not 50%. And then he lost. And he was like, I don't understand it. I got the most votes. I should have become mayor. But I wanted to take him by the shoulders and say, Don, let me explain this to you. The majority of people in Oakland did not want you. They wanted the second and third candidates, which were actually Rebecca Kaplan was one of them. And the other one was, um, uh, oh, her name escapes me, uh, the, the first Asian American woman who was uh, mayor of, of Oakland. Uh, she, became, she became mayor because when you ranked the votes, Rebecca, the, the two, the second and third place, were stronger than the first place and more and closer in values. So one of them got elected, which was perfect. It's like, so Don, most people did not want you. Ranked choice voting is good in that way, but generally what do people vote for? Do they vote first for the peace and freedom candidate or the green candidate? No, they vote among the people that they think can win. How do you, that, and that's the main reason people don't vote greens, I think or peace and freedom, is that they can't win. I mean, I've had people <laughs> that have known me for 20 years. They know pretty much what you see is what you get. They know me. And they and the, when I ran for governor, I said, oh, I really wanted to vote for you, Laura. I go, wanted? And they said, yeah, but I was so afraid of Meg Whitman. She was the uh, billionaire who ran against Jerry Brown in 2010. And I said, she was... Uh, I said, did you vote in advance? I was trying to get, and they said, no, no, I voted on the day. He was 12 points ahead, <laughs> you know, please. Um, and and somebody else, same thing, you know. So even if they know you, they think you can't win. So what the heck, you know, it's like, why vote for you? So ranked choice voting isn't really it, but proportional representation. You end up having people in the legislature, they win, they can win. And then um, you have, uh, then you get the idea that they can win. And that's at the local level. Um, so proportional representation, for example, a five-person district instead of five one-person district where it's a first past the post, where if you get 45%, you win, you know, in the, in the system that we've got in the, for the legislature, this is for legislative offices. You get five, you'd have a peace and freedom. You'd have a green, you'd have a libertarian. You might have in some districts, um, two Democrats in some districts, two Republicans or three or whatever, but you would have a mix. And people for a while, it was, I think in the state of Illinois, even people liked it because the other parties that they disagreed with were there because their jobs were actually better because they could wrestle with things. It wasn't just lined up. Um, Democrats are going to go this way, Republicans are going to go this way, and neither way is good for the rest of the country. So proportional representation and ranked choice voting, yes, and free airtime, media. When I ran against um, Meg Whitman and Jerry Brown in 2010, if, if she was a billionaire, I was getting no corporate money, um, my, voluntarily, deliberately. If they, if they would have said, okay, you can have all the money that she spent in her campaign, all, you know, her budget, you could have her campaign budget or the free airtime she got, the time that she got covered by the media, I would have taken the media. I would have taken that all that time that she was on the radio or TV and and forego her billion dollars. But I think she only spent 120 million or something on her campaign. She didn't spend the she still had a billion dollars left when all things were said and done. But um free airtime. 
I've run for office. I didn't mean to, uh, never had intended to run for office. I started running every four years in 2002. No, I'm not going to run again. But um, they, I was able to see how things closed down, closed down, closed down every single four years, less, less, and less. So abolish the Electoral College. I don't need to say anything more about that other than the fact that it's a good demonstration about how strong and stable our Constitution is. We can't change even something like that that's so stupid and was based on us counting slaves so that the Southern states would join the Union because otherwise they didn't have enough voters to um, have enough strength. And so as, since then, a whole lot of presidents have come from the South because they, they you know, they wanted to make sure that the South was happy, and all of that, citizen education, citizens assemble, and weekend elections, what's up with Tuesdays, short campaigns so that they can't get bought out, same-day voter registration, don't do mandated voting, um, paper ballots as in combination with um, with systematic, you know, statewide, nationwide, you can't even uh, look at how the uh, whether an election is corrupt in the U.S., it's so impossible um, because every county does a different system, can do. Uh, stop top two in California, thank you very much. And with that, I'll just say, please consider your voter registration as a power that you have and use it as strongly as you can. If you can possibly, whatever state or wherever you are, not registered Democrat, and rather than the independent, please go with one of the independent alternative, no corporate money progressive parties, and vote that way. Um, and, and and encourage all of your friends. Please, millions of people could go toward alternatives and build a better uh, country. So thank you. Minute over. Okay, well, thank you, Laura. This was a great talk. And uh, personally, I just have to say, I always appreciate the fact that you have solutions. You're not just like many of us griping about the system. You're working with the system. You have solutions and keep up the good work. Thank you. But we have some, we'll go, before we go to comments or questions or Q&A, um, we do have some announcements to make. And is Alan on? Do you want to say something about uh, next week's um, program? Is Alan with us? Sure, Gene. Um, next week, we're going to have uh, Noah Kirchak, who will be speaking on uh, Marxism and the working class. Noah is a very interesting uh, person. He's a, a union carpenter working out of the Midwest. He's also one of the co-founders of the Midwestern Marx uh, organization. We've had two speakers from Midwestern Marx on and somebody who's directly involved in workplace organizing and uh, Marxist pol politics in the working class. So it should be a very, very interesting program. I encourage everybody to uh, spread the word and uh, come to the program next week. Noah from Midwestern Marks. Okay, and after that, we have uh, Mark Albertson, who has spoken before with us uh, on uh, Ceasefire Korea, the tragic split and its contemporary implications. And as always, uh, Mark is a very interesting speaker. So, um, and... Uh, Richard, well, I, I just want to say also, um, Richard Fallenbaum, or do you want to say anything about money? Um, or uh, urge people to go to our website, icssmarks.org, where you can, first of all, sign up for the to get the reminders for these programs. And secondly, you can make a contribution uh, to the ICSS. Um, so um, we'll switch to um, um, people who want to speak. And I see many people have already seen that. If you want to speak, you go down to the bottom of your screen where there is a place for reactions and you push on that and that will put you on the stack. And right now I have Rich J, uh, Sharon, uh, Yusuf, Steve Zeltzer, 
Richard Wright and Janet Corbin. So, um, Rich, you're on. And you have two minutes. Rich, you need to unmute yourself and... Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, uh, I have a question, Laura. Uh, uh, first, I want to... Uh, the, the first part of the question is, uh, you, you did... I don't remember you speaking about Bernie Sanders' race, uh, I think 2016, um, where he did quite well, I think surprisingly well. And my question is related to that. Can you imagine uh, in California, a candidate, I don't have a name, I don't have a particular person in mind, you might have a good idea, uh, running uh, for either governor or some very high level uh, statewide uh, as a candidate uh, running as a socialist and doing well using those parameters that you uh, stated like uh, no, taking no corporate money and things like that and with the intention uh, planning over a few years uh, four or five ten years before they do it uh, to uh, you know have a properly prepared campaign uh, I think one of the outstanding things about Bernie is in the uh, he was in the uh, Congress, I guess, for so long as an uh, as an independent, uh, and sometimes known as a socialist. Uh, and we know how well he did and how he didn't make it, and all. And then what happened towards the end, and you know, we went over and supported Biden. I think, but anyway, I'm just asking that question. Can you imagine? Um, someone in the statewide level uh, in California running as a socialist and doing well? That's it. I, shall I take a few questions? and or? Uh, why don't you go one by one? Okay, uh, good. Or, 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 however you really want, but one okay. by one is fine. All right. Um, Bernie Sanders, um, thank you for asking about Bernie Sanders. Uh, and I, I wanted to say a couple of things about him is that he didn't want to do a nader, which is that he wanted to run, even though he was an independent, he wanted to run as a Democrat because the way the system is set up, that's where he would get more airplay. He would be in the debates, you know, that kind of thing. And so he, um, so now we have, rather than do a nader, we have a do a Bernie. And so he did a Bernie twice. And what a Bernie is, is that you run inside the Democratic Party because it can get you more airtime and get you in the debates and all of that. And, and oh my goodness, ballot access, that you don't have to worry about ballot access. So let me take this opportunity to tell you about that. And Cornell West is running as, as you probably know, as for the to be nominated to be the nominate the candidate for the Green Party and possibly for peace peace and freedom. And so that's all to be decided. But he's running. And so ballot access has gotten in the news a little bit more. Democrats and Republicans automatically have ballot access. Bernie automatically had ballot access. The other parties have to struggle for it the whole time and um get up to you know the high 40s. Uh, and 40, you know, 45 or 48 states out of 50 that they're on the ballot and then they're still not allowed in the debate. So Bernie, uh, and, and I'll give you a quick thing about the debates is that one possibility is how about having everybody in the debate who could possibly get enough votes because they're on enough ballots in enough states that they could could uh, technically, mathematically, they have a chance of winning. Put them in the debates. Then you'd have some, some many years, you would have had a Democrat, a Republican, a Green, and a Libertarian. And the debates would have meant a whole lot more to the whole American people than they have with the with the two, whether it's at the state level or the national level. So Bernie was in the debates. Bernie got airtime. He he got royally um, 
uh, he, the Democratic Party apparatus is what did it in 2016, did him in. And I can't believe how I'm always, I started in 2020, I started thinking, oh my God, maybe they, he's going to make it. Oh my goodness. And then they, my understanding is that a, a bunch of powerful, as the Black Agenda Report um, would call them, misleadership, the mis the Black misleadership, um, convinced uh, people, and I think Obama was part of that, convinced pe Black voters that white people wouldn't vote for uh, Bernie Sanders. And so, you know, maybe he's maybe what he's saying is, you know, sounds like some good stuff, but he can't win uh, against Trump. And if you vote for, you know, and so they uh, and so they stopped voting for him even in the primary so that he, they did not want him to be the candidate. They wanted this, uh, you know, this <laughs> Biden type person um, to be the candidate or Clinton in 20 Hillary Clinton in 2016. So can I imagine, um, I can imagine it. I just wish it would come sooner than when I can imagine it. You know, I, I hate, I really hate the thing. Well, maybe it's got to get worse before it gets better because it can always get worse. It can always, it doesn't automatically get better just because it gets worse. But I can imagine it. Um, but it, but it's hard because of the resources, especially the media, because the the information that gets put inside our heads, and by media, I even mean textbooks, school textbooks, uh, let alone TV and the internet and and the radio. But sooner or later, it's going to happen. Also, the U.S. Uh, the rest of the world is putting a balance on the U.S. So the rest of the world is getting tired of the way the U.S. government is is handling things, and sooner or later that the U.S. is going to catch up a little bit to that. So I'll, I'll a long answer to your short question, but okay, thank you. And next on the list is Sharon. Go ahead, Sharon. Thank you. Um... I have some comments and then a question for you, Laura. So I'd like to share my education, my personal education about third parties. I was six years old in 1948 and my parents were having a big argument. My mother was a dyed in the wool FDR person and my father was more to the left. And my mother looked at my father and said, if Dewey wins, it's gonna be your fault. Oh, so. Yeah. He was voting for Wallace, right? Yeah. And so that was, I remember that over the years, um, trying to understand third party candidates in, in this country. And um, I, I agree with almost everything you said. And, you know, I am the uh, head of the catalog committee at the library, Marsis Library. And we have, we've been going through a lot of stuff that we have that has not been cataloged so that we can make it more available to people. And we have a lot of ephemera, news, old, old Communist Party newspapers from going back into the 30s and pamphlets. And um, there was a time when the Communist Party ran candidates in this country. The last time was 1984. And they also ran candidates in California, interestingly enough, for the Supreme Court and a lot, and the governor and a lot of others that people have completely forgotten. I think it would be nice if somebody writes a book about that experience. And I've always thought that it was a shame that they stopped running national candidates because it's a platform to make your views known. Um, but it, they did so because it was so much, it got so much harder to be on the ballot progressively, not just in California, right. but everywhere. So that, and it's just, it was just too hard. Um, but if anybody wants to look at that ephemera, I'll be happy to show you. Um, so my question is, um, 
the things you mentioned in terms of the process to try to make it easier for uh, um, other parties to be represented, especially proportional representation. Those are so important. So my, my question is, does the Green Party have a plan to campaign for that or try to win some of the, those process questions, uh, either in California or nationally? Because I think unless we organize for it, it's never going to happen. No. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Laura, just a quick, just a quick note. Uh, the effectiveness of your talk has inspired many hands to come up. So maybe try to keep the responses short so we can get everybody in. We don't have that much time, but give it a shot. You're doing too good of a job. So unfortunately, you're, you're muted. Yep. Um, thanks for your kind way of expressing that. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'll put in the chat, there's a, a Pro Rep Coalition, and if I forget to put in the chat, um, you can look that up. Pro Rep Coalition that's working um, inside California. We, there's always the hope that California, being such a, you know, a nation state, um, if if we start things here, healthcare, um, proportional representation, that it could spread. Uh, and so I'll try to put that in the ch in the chat and. Uh, you reminded me that like a lot of times the people people that have criticisms of this, well, how come the Greens run nationally? You always run nationally, you don't run locally. Well, you know, we do run locally and we have won locally, but two things. One is that we have to run for president and peace and freedom has to run for president to stay alive at the local level. You know, we absolutely have to do it and it helps a whole lot of states to get ballot access. California has it because we have enough register registrants in both Green Party and Peace and Freedom Party, but that but it helps people become activated. And uh, let's face it, a whole lot of citizens, their level of political participation is president, you know, and maybe governor, maybe mayor, you know, but um, so we have to run for president. And the second thing is they fight you just as hard at the local level. You know, it's not like, well, they say, well, what about the Republicans? You know, they took over the school boards and stuff. Well, you take a billion dollars, you can do anything. Do you know, if you take in that money um, and, you, and you're not having the newspapers fight against you and, and stuff like that, because the newspapers are definitely part of the military, industrial, you know, corporate media complex. Short answer. Okay, moving forward, uh, we have Yusuf. You have two minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, well, well, while I agree with uh, most of uh, your demands, um, you have failed to present what's the philosoph what's the ideology of the Green Party? What's uh, what's the philosophical framework uh, uh, you work with, if any? Uh, second uh, is a comment. Well, first, uh, first of all, uh, I think by pro even proportional representation is a halfway measure uh, unless you abolish the executive system, the presidential system, the, the, the system of uh, governors and uh, the president, because you can't have a proportional uh, representation if the president is very powerful or the governor is very powerful. Uh, okay, so this is a brief. I have uh, more comments and questions I will ask later. Okay, thank you, Laura. Okay, so your your question is you're you're saying that if we have proportional representation and we still have such a strong ex executive branch, that that would um, not be as helpful as perhaps I want to think that it would be. Um, and I, I think that uh, that that's true. And I would also say about the Supreme Court that the way that 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 those two things are are structured are are in bad shape. The first thing I would do about the executive, and I did mention, was um, 
get rid of the Electoral College. I mean, both Bush in 2000, George W. Bush in 2000, and Trump in 2016, both did not get the popular vote, and they uh, took office because of the Electoral College. Now, what the Green Party stands for, the there are 10 key values, and uh, you could look up Green Party 10 key values and get the whole list, but they, but they are summarized into four pillars. Um, one is that our our name is both a good thing and and a not so good thing because people think of it as only the environment, and that only is an odd word to use since the environment is where we live. Um, but it's environment is one, and social justice is another, and that includes um, feminism and uh, respect for diversity and uh, other things as well, you know, social justice. Uh, criminal justice, please. We are the US and, and California has more like per capita, at some point had more incarcerated people per capita than, you know, California was only second to the US in the world. I'm not sure whether that's still true. Um, so that's two, environment, social justice, peace and nonviolence and grassroots democracy. And so decentralization comes into the grassroots democracy. Uh, restorative justice is part of that, you know, but the, but that's that's basically what we stand for. And do not and a commitment not to take corporate money. Because the minute you take corporate money, it wipes out all those other things. Certainly wipes out environment. It wipes out social justice. You need the capitalism, capitalism needs the other isms like six, sexism and racism um, in order to keep people separated, in order to keep people focused on those things, in order to use those things to blame, you know, groups of like immigrants to blame for the eco economy so that people don't go, duh, I thought it was the Wall Street banks that brought down the economy. It turns out it was immigrants. You know, we, they need those isms. You can't have any one of those you know, peace and nonviolence, social justice, grassroots democracy, a decent environment. You can't have any of those without working on all of them together. That was one of the things that drew me to the Green Party was that it was the, to, that all of those things work together. The problems exacerbate each other and the solutions in any one area helps the other. Reduce the military, improve the environment. It's automatic. Um, and, uh, and, the commitment to take no corporate money, which means that the actions will follow the words. Okay. Uh, thank you, Laura. Let me just add, first of all, that we all know that America has the best politicians that money can buy. So we should keep that in mind. And yeah. also, I just want to note for particularly people in California, the Alameda Green Party puts out a green voter guide every year that covers not only the big national and state elections, but also down to the level of dog catcher and things like that. Mm -hmm. And and that's very useful. And that's, you know, Green Party is doing just, just so much great stuff. But uh, sorry about that. We'll go on to Steve. You have two minutes. Yeah, Steve well, Thompson. I think that the issue of uh, building a working class political alternative is central. And of course, the history of the United States is that uh, the capitalist parties do not want third parties, Greens or anybody else for that matter, to be running. But we also have to look at the, what happened in the working class because the Communist Party actually played a key role in supporting the Democratic Party, and they continue to do that. Uh, Gus Hall and the Communist Party had a history of supporting the Democrats, and they support them today. Biden, uh, Obama, uh, they attacked uh, Bernie Sanders, they attacked Nader for even running. Uh, that's the history of the Communist Party, of propping up the Democrats. And in California, you know, the, uh, uh, the Communist Party does not support the Democrats, but groups like the PSL and ANSWER, who played a leading role in the Peace and Freedom Party, have never really gone on the offensive against the Democrats politically when they run candidates. They, uh, when they run, they usually don't attack the Democrats. Uh, they run it as a campaign to recruit to their party. Um, and I would say the Greens and Peace and Freedom Party, for example, supported Rebecca Kaplan, who was a Democrat, 
Uh, Rebecca Kaplan abandoned the Greens because she wanted to get elected. Uh, that's unprincipled, and I think is a, a capitulation to to the capitalist parties. But I mean, the central question for the working class and building a political alternative is the role of the union bureaucracy in breaking workers and the unions from the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democratic Party uh, has embedded itself in the unions and the union bureaucracy is part of the Democratic Party in California. In fact, uh, they actually told people in the labor councils to join the Democratic Party and run as a Democrat. So that means a, a political fight against the union bureaucracy. The best way we can do that is uh, is to fight in the unions for democracy, for rank membership control, and for a labor party against the Democrats and Republicans. And this UAW strike, and we're, there's going to be a rally that's coming set, not this Saturday, next Saturday, at the um, uh, Cruise Company, which is owned by General Motors, is to unite workers uh, for 30 for 40, is to unite workers for COLA, as the United Workers for a break with the Democrats and for the unions to support a workers' party. Uh, a, a, if the unions uh, break with minutes, the Democrats, Steve. that would be a political development because the Democrats, the unions are a key force uh, in supporting the Democratic Party in California and nationally. Last point I wanted to make is the role of the ex uh, CPers, uh, the Wellstone Club, which supports uh, the uh, Democrats at KPFA, supports the Zionists. Uh, and supports the Democratic Party at KPFA and Pacifica and play a dangerous role in propagandizing now for war uh, at KPFA with uh, Ian Masters and other uh, right-wingers, Brian Edward Teeger, who have become propagandists for NATO and, and for U.S. imperialism. Okay, so that's been that's three minutes, Dave. That's the political aspect of the fight in the Democrat, against the Democratic Party. Okay, thank you, Steve. Laura. Okay, I'll just say... Um, Hey, man, about the media um, from one of the things that is so difficult is that the media is so is lockstep. And I'm thinking about foreign policy, um, Latin America. I'm, I'm part of the task force on the Americas. And um, it's so hard for ordinary people to believe these things that say the ICSS, you know, the understandings and, the, you know, the learnings that we've had um, and the Green Party and Peace and Freedom, it's so hard for people to get it because everybody in the media, all the information from Fox News to KPFA even, you know, it's, it's a, there's a spectrum where KPFA and KQED and all of that are better but they're the ones that determine, and, and KPFA, less and less coverage over the years that I've been paying attention, you know, 20, whatever, three years. Um, and they've, uh, and 30 years in the Green Party. But anyway, they less and less and less do they cover anything but the Democrats. And they're lining up with the Democratic Party's horrible um, foreign policy uh decisions if you want war you know it's almost like elect a democrat you know you'll get it okay thank you uh next is richard w and then janet so richard you got two minutes i'll i'll try to be brief um i i sort of wanted to ratify um uh, what steve just said uh not not totally but uh but at least in part um uh yeah uh i i've sort of decided that from here on out uh as a as a personal statement uh that i'm not simply going to vote anymore for any democrats at any level um i call it a personal strike if you will uh but in part because uh because even at the local school board level or at the local city council level they basically act as a uh, uh, a training ground for further advancement, and at the at the at, in, in Texas, um, they in large measure simply ratify the the uh, 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 the military budget, um, and uh, as as a way of getting money into the, into the economy, um, and it's over and over and over again. Uh, and so I, I decided to uh, simply um, uh, not. Uh, we're, and I, I, you know, I mean, 
and I'm, I'm, at, I'm at odds with my union because the union is, has become basically the, uh, the, the, the tail of the Democratic Party. Uh, they, you know, now they're they're just simply w- out there working uh, to get uh, Democrats elected, and um, uh, and needless to say, I'm I'm uh, um, <laughs> I'm the lone I'm a lone wolf on that one. Uh, I have I have had the opportunity to see third parties on on um, uh, and uh, uh, on basically on three coasts. Um, you know, back back when I, I, I came from Maine, uh, I, I, I went to school in Oregon, uh, and obviously I'm down here in Austin. I've I've been uh, I've I've worked uh, for the Citizens Party. I've I've worked for the Labor Party. I've worked for the Green Party. I, um, um, That's you know, two minutes. I, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'll shut up. Bye. Oh, okay. Thank you, um, Laura. Do you want to respond? Just quickly that there, I'm I'm sure that we're all taking a little bit of, you know, we have a little bit of hope and taking heart in what's happening in some of the unions where the rank and file, um, the workers are actually making some headway, and, uh, it, you know, it it's overdue. But, uh, you know, there's some some hope there. And I was uh, thinking of in 2002 was the coup in Venezuela against Hugo Chavez. And there was also, um, you know, and then later in 2011, there was the uh, the 99 percent, the uh, the Occupy movement and the one percent. It's just like cuts across what what whether you're the one percent of the unions or the one percent of the um of the uh church or the one percent of everything else you know but even the unions and the churches and all of that those one percent all stick together you know the top uh hierarchy of whatever organization it is acts as bad as the ceos of the of warren wall street uh and so that's something to um that's a reason for decentralization and for grassroots democracy to be such an important thing and 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 end up you know try to move towards citizens councils town councils you know things like that that are a little bit outside the scope of most political parties yeah janet okay thank you next we have janet and richard fallenbaum followed by david Janet. Are you unmuted? Sorry, I'm having problems with my <laughs> computer. Um, so anyway, uh, and my sound went off a little earlier. Um, thank you, Laura, for this presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions. Cornell West has been resisting injustice as a scholar and an activist, but has no experience in the executive branch of any government. To me, he's being the Green, uh, his being the Green Party presidential candidate has more to do with cult of personality and not really promoting the Green Party. He's been running as an individual as though there's nothing more to the Green Party other than him. So far, I've not heard him talk about the 10 key values or the four pillars or the Green Party platform. What does the Green Party hope to accomplish by running him as the presidential candidate? That's one question. I also wanted to mention uh, that at the 2016 Green Party presidential convention I uh, that I attended as a Jill Stein delegate, a bunch of disgruntled burners who had been burned by him uh, came. Uh, most of them were still Democrats and hadn't been required to join the Green Party at the time, but they were welcomed to help strengthen the Jill Stein campaign because they had knowledge of the Bernie campaign's successful organizing skills and structure. I don't know if they ever joined the Green Party, but to me, this was a dilution of the Green Party. Um, but all right, so another question is, would you talk about the factions within the Green Party 
especially those in Alameda County. Um, and finally, speaking of parties, can I make a quick announcement about an October 2nd event, which is not part of, that does not have to do with this. It, can I do this now or? Can you do it in 15 seconds? I'll try. Okay. Um, the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru Solidarity Movement has been leading a reparations campaign for African Americans and the African people for decades in the form of returning some of your resources gained by the legacy of colonization. They have recently come under attack by the FBI, which has indicted three of its leaders for being Russian agents. Um, the Uhuru Three, Chairman O'Malley Yashatila, Benny Hess, and Jesse Neville, uh, will be speaking in Oakland on Monday, October 2nd at 6.30 at Oak Stop. And I will paste the registration link in the chat. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Laura. Okay. When, uh, um, Cornell West, uh, one of the things that he can do that I'm looking forward to his being able to do actually relates to the latter, latter part of your comment, which is, uh, which are reparations. Do you know that he can make a case for those kinds of things? And he has worked with the isms. And if the, if the sexism and racism and homophobism and all of that, if the, if we try to get to, um, a peaceful world, an ecological world, without dealing with those things, we're not going to make it. We've got to deal with all of those things at the same time. And different people are strong in different areas. Um, and so I don't, I don't think he's been an environmental activist, but he has definitely been an activist in other ways. He's been arrested a bunch of times. You know, he's put his, his um, himself on the line. And uh, one of the things that I really like about him is that, well, first I'm going to take care of the factions in Alameda County because I don't actually know about the factions in Alameda County. Maybe I'm in one and I don't know it. But um, I know that there are factions in the state. Um, and I know that there are factions in the PTAs and in the churches and in families. And, you know, that happens. And I think I, I, I tend, um, you know, when it gets to be where people are impeding uh, the contributions of other people, which happens, you know, then let's fight against that. But, but the fact divide and conquer is such a huge thing that um, I, I don't like to give it as a, a lot of, if I can avoid giving it energy, I try to avoid giving it energy. Um, and and that brings me back to Cornell West. One of the things that he is always saying is that issue by issue, there are various people you can work with. Don't cut out anybody. Don't rule out anybody. Don't X out anybody as a potential help, you know, that, you know, let them prove that they're not helpful, but don't um, automatically assume that because they're in favor of this, there's so many lines now. People will say, well, if you're not against uh, vaccinations, I'm not going to vote for you. It's whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, it's like, that's an important thing. Yes. But, um, can we work together on the things that we can work together on? Uh, and and I like that about Cornell West. He he wants to reach out to the people. What did, what did he he said recently? Like one eighth. I forget this the exact st statistic, but we've all we all know that a lot of people who voted for Bernie in the primaries ended up voting for Trump. We also know that people who voted for Obama once, if not twice, ended up voting for Trump because Obama didn't deliver. And they go, okay, let's try the other one because the two-party system just tells us there are two. And so they go, well, the other one. And um, an earlier comment about people who, uh, who uh, have no integrity if they go to the Democratic Party just because they want to win and stuff like that, that's the way the system is set up. You know, um, Kevin Mejia, went to the Democrats and won. Ah, you know, it's that what the frustrating part about that to me is not Kevin Mejia, the one who uh, I mentioned ran for Congress one on one, and then he's now the LA controller. He, it, the problem isn't Kenneth Mejia, the problem is the system and that he he were, was working within the system. 
Um, and so, yeah, da -da -da, let's see, but next year. Yeah, I mean, Cornell West is not this year expecting to win. He's going to go for winning as much as he can. But he's, uh, when they, to, to talk about, uh, you know, the best resume is Biden's in terms of having experience in executive offices. And I don't give him any credit for having that experience. Yeah, I remember when I ran for Congress, uh, as a Peace and Freedom candidate, people would sometimes ask us, uh, are you a serious candidate or are you just running on the issues? Which is an amusing <laughs> yeah. comment. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, Richard uh, Fallenbaum, followed yeah. by David. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Laura, and I was intrigued by your mention of the international connections of the Green Party. I'm wondering whether what the impact on the Green Party in the United States with the of the, of the fact that the uh, German Green Party, which is the most prominent party, Green Party in the world, is such a reactionary pro-militarist organization and so tied into the uh, the imperialist you know the Atlantis system uh, does that does that impact the, the class character of the US party um, and secondly I just want to make the, that's my question the comment I have it seems to me that the big issue political issue is the uh, is the relative Lots of passivity of the U.S. working class, and what I'm interested in is is things that will will spark a um, an upsurge in the in the working class that will shake the system and undermine it a little bit. And um, you know, some candidacies have done it a little bit. Jesse Jackson did a little bit. Uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, I don't see uh, Cornell West doing it, um, possibly Kennedy, but I'm not, I'm not really, um, maybe he's not quite forceful enough, but um, that, you know, it doesn't seem to me a question of just third parties or democratic parties, anybody, you know, the, somebody in the right place at the right time with the right organization may, may be able to, shake up the system through the electoral system. Even Trump did it. So, your response. Okay, go okay. ahead, Laura. Uh, yeah. Um, the German Green Party, uh, that, I don't know how, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, they, we still, in the green, even within the Green Party, huge topic, Ukraine. Um, but within the Green Party, there's differences about, you know, like going, helping the underdog of Ukraine or, 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 um, peace and free. My, <laughs> in a nutshell, my, my opinion is don't strengthen the United States by any means necessary. Do not strengthen the United States, strengthen the United Nations. Yes, it's weak, but that's a lot because of the U.S. The U.S. could do things to make it stronger and we could do negotiations to the U.N. That's my opinion. Other people have different opinions. The German Greens have different opinions. People are pointing out that the other Green parties in Europe have different opinions. Um, that it's, it's, very difficult when um, bombs are dropping in your backyard and uh, people, you know, it's just really difficult. I think Cornell West does have a chance to shake some things up. One of the things I like about Cornell West also that I meant to mention is that I wish a whole lot of people would do what he has done as a as somebody who's been on na national TV and he's been an activist and all of that stuff. And he gave up on the Democratic Party. You know, he's like, he, I'm not going to run with the Democrats. And he and Harry Belafonte, one of my favorite um, lines was that at some point Obama ran into Harry Belafonte and Cornel West, both of whom really supported him in 2008 to, to get him into office and really helped him a lot. And, and Obama said, when are you two guys going to cut me? When are you going to cut me some slack? Quite different from 
make me do it. <laughs> it's like, when are you going to cut me some slack? And, and Cornell West or Harry Belafonte, one or the other said, Mr. President, we already are. You know, totally cutting him some slack. But I think that Cornell West moving from we need more people that people are that are well known people, written books, you know, all that, whatever, um, who move, who leave the Democratic Party. Don't we wish, I, I'm maybe not everybody on this call, but maybe everybody on this call, don't we wish that Bernie Sanders had left the Democratic Party, had said, hey, you just messed the, the American people out of being able to make their choices toward democratic socialism. I'm going independent. That's what the People's Party wanted him to do. That's what, you know, the green go with, oh, you know, but he didn't do it. Cornell West, um, in his capacity of whatever it was, he is doing it. I wish a whole lot of people would do that. And I hope that he ends up being a model for that. Okay, thank you. I think next is David. David, are you unmuted? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Um, when, when the Green Party has been electorally successful, what what do you think were the factors in in their success, and what were the issues that resonated with voters? The well, for for example, um, the Richmond, California is a great example, and they had a Richmond Progressive Alliance, and were working together. Uh, it wasn't just Greens, but it was Greens and Democrats and Independents and and I'm sure Peace and Freedom and, and so on. Um, and they organized neighborhood by neighborhood. They, you know, they walked the precincts and all of that. And they would they would talk about what things that were important to people. For example, the Republicans have sort of um, carved were supposedly carving their their niche as like anti-crime and the Democrats were soft on crime. And then, of course, we had Bill Clinton and Joe Biden and all of that. So, no, we're tough on crime, too. Um, so so they would talk about crime, which people were concerned about, the homicides and the every other kind of crime. And so they would address that and to have community p policing and accountability of the police and things like that. So they, so the basic thing is to talk about what is important to the people. Potholes are important, yes. Um, schools and so on and so, and um, and having people uh, pay their fair share of taxes. Again, Richmond had Chevron and it wasn't paying the fair share of taxes. Uh, there was uh, there were taxes when Matt Gonzalez was uh, was in uh, San Francisco on the board. He talked about taxes as well. It's like, OK, so let's raise the taxes Prop 13 is a huge limitation on what you can do with taxes, but let's do this with tax, 2% something properties. And people go, no, no, no. He goes, okay, 1%, do you know? And just go toward um, in, uh, increasing the taxes so that the money could be spent on what's important to the people, the libraries, the schools, the potholes, and all of that stuff. And so that's how people have, have won um, and a lot of it does have to do with, like I was mentioning, Kashama Sawant, I've mentioned Gail McLaughlin, Matt Gonzalez, there are other people who've won, that they have people behind them, they have an organization behind them that they're part of, Socialist Alternative, for example, with Kashama Sawant. And they stay with that group when they're elected. It's not just a group to get them elected. It's a group of organized people that that their organization increases after the person is, is elected. And they have their feelers in the neighborhood. Well, they are the neighborhood. And they're um, in constant communication to know what is wanted and needed. And they do that. That it, like I said, I think the anti-crime thing is a is a perfect example. It's like you don't have to be a, a, a reactionary right winger to be concerned about crime. So that's how they win. How they okay, won. Thank you, and I'll remind everybody that we're 
uh, running out of time. We have uh, we have a mandatory end time of uh, twelve thirty, which we try to observe. So um, we can bear that in mind. We have uh, Kit next, and then Gene has a comment, and then uh, we we'll, hopefully we'll get to a second round of Yusuf, but uh, we're going to have to bring it to an end soon. Yeah, uh, uh, Kit, go ahead. Are you still with us, Kit? Okay. Hi, sorry, I was finally trying to find the mute button. Okay, thank you, Laura Wells. Um, anyway, I thank you for your presentation. You did a very convincing and educational uh, presentation that helps us understand this problem better about parties. I, I thought it was excellent. Uh, you should be doing a tour circuit at the colleges to talk to young voters about this. Um, anyway, uh, what I have a few statements here. Uh, I think the Green Party needs to uh, have its local can that have people who want to become candidates have actually worked in government to um, tack onto their resumes. And I'm talking about getting jobs and and inside those departments that they can see running for future office. Um, and I know that's a long term commitment, but I think that's one of the things that voters look for is experience, solid experience in their uh, candidacy. Um, also, um, we recently heard of a, there was uh, uh, Chesa Boudin and Pamela Price uh, spoke recently about this issue about uh, recalls and uh, they brought to our attention that there is a national, a conscious national campaign to recall even elected progressive candidates uh, by the GOP and their allies. And I think a lot of folks who are like on the next door and all that don't realize that they're sucking into that, uh, it, and sucking into that uh, campaign. Um, and it's so easy for them to get involved in character assassination. So you're really right about that. Um, someone has to be a practically a saint to run for office these days. Um, uh, I guess my question is, do you know what's happening with Nadia Benjamin since uh, Code Bink Pink was identified as an enemy of the state? Uh, thank you. Okay, the, for the, the last part, I don't have any inside information about what's happening with Medea Benjamin. I, from what I do know of Medea, uh, it's not going to stop her. And that's one of the reasons that, that I meant to mention about why we haven't been assassinated, we political parties and progressive you know, alternatives, is that we won't stop. You know, we won't stop. And, and Medea is definitely one of those uh, people. It's outrageous. The, what's being called, you know, uh, Cop City and 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 Atlanta, and you know what's being called terrorism now, Uhuru, and you know all of those things. It's it's outrageous, um, and it's not just the Republicans, as as we know. Um, the uh, you mentioned college, and w during my campaigns, that's what I wanted to do. I mean, I had a list of of the whatever eleven or 12 U University of Californias and the 30 some Cal states. It was so hard to get to, to get there, even before the pandemic, you know, when it was so hard to get something organized because the students aren't there for very long and then they move on. And then the next time there's different people and, and uh, yeah, but it, it and, and I actually, I, Coincidentally, I've got something coming up in about 10 days where I'm talking to a, a group of people, um, a student uh, um, uh, at, a, at a college, and um, they where they actually want people from all different, they want representatives from all the political parties. And that's something that doesn't happen all that often. Um, I wanted to mention about the media, just a quick example. Um, the forum, which was on KQED, when I first ran in 2002, they had us all in a room, all together, everybody who was running for state controller, that was what I mostly ran, follow the money, if you want to know what the, what's really going on. Um, and they had all of us in the room, Democrats, Republicans, but peace and freedom, uh, 
green. Um, then the next, then like a, a later time, they had the Democrats and the Republicans on in one half hour show, and then all the rest of us in another half hour show. And the Republican didn't even show up. So the Democrat had 30 minutes of a show, and we had four or five people um, in a half an hour in the same length of time. And then later, not at all. You know, so it went from that to that. Another thing I, that I forgot to mention, the cost of running is so much more expensive. Why are we seeing fewer candidates? It's a whole lot more expensive to run. When I first ran, it was zero um, dollars per word in your in your ballot statement. And then it became $25 per word. It got to where my, my no corporate money um, budget, you know, all from individual donations, um, I would sp spend almost a half of it sent to the state of California in a complete uh, reversal of public campaign finance. We, I, I was spending thousands and thousands of dollars, even though you try to keep a short um, ballot statement because it goes to every voter household in the in the state and you want to do it, but it's $25 a word. And so it doesn't, you know, it builds up really fast. Every single four years and that I watched, it got harder, harder, harder to do with media, to do with the regulations, to do with um, everything. It was incredible. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, we're getting close to the end time. I just wanted to uh, ask a question or make a comment, and I think I know your answer, but I've been, I have this settle for Biden cup. And there is the argument that, uh, well, let's face it, you know, it's either going to be Biden or Trump. And why can't we just settle for Trump, settle for Biden? Well, you, well, you, you just said it. You just answered your question with your little Freudian slip there. Because well, Biden, Biden is the Trump from 30 years ago, you know, like his, Biden's stances are what Trump's would have been like 30 years ago. It has all moved in that direction, especially in California. Can I do this in a minute? It's it's a big conundrum within the Green Party. There's this thing called safe states. And some people just get the heebie jeebies. They do not want to talk about safe states. Like if you're in a swing state, OK, maybe consider settle for Biden. But if you're not in a swing, see, to me, it's it we I would I think we should say if you're not in a swing state, my God, Vote for the alternative. A million people, more than a million people could vote for Cornell West in California. And Biden is in no danger of, of getting um, of getting all because of the stupid electoral college of getting all the electoral votes of California. And so don't settle for he's a good Joe. He's not a good Joe. I mean, my God, the, the tiny things he does. $10,000 of student debt or not enabling the corporations to fight as hard against unions. Give me a break. Oh, okay. Well, 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 well thank you. Um, I, I see Raj has his hand up and Yusuf, if, can you ask real quick questions? Cause we only have five minutes and I want to give uh, Laura at least a minute or two to uh, sum up. So, uh, Yusuf, can you? Yeah, but well, I'll make a quick comment that um, uh, Steve brought up uh, CPUSA and CPUSA never used the word support. Uh, it, 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 it used the word vote. We believe that support and vote are different. Uh, Laura might disagree with that, and Steve might disagree with that, but that's uh, our analysis. And the person who specifically uh, was against uh, uh, Biden's candidacy, uh, no, not Biden, um, uh, Bernie Sanders' candidacy uh, is no longer with us. Uh, so let me, um, uh, and Laura, you, you really didn't answer my question about uh, ideology. Ideology and principle are somewhat different. Uh, there may be, Ideologies serve a philosophical framework or saying the state of the United States, the struggle, state of the struggle in the United States is, is such and such. Um, so you only partially answered my question. If you want, it's usually, well, we 
are inspired by uh, some political theorist or some political theory of your own. Uh, what you said is Prince Party Principles and not quite political theory. Um, if you have something to say on that, uh, please do. Okay, thank you, Yusuf. We'll ask you to hold off on that, just part of your uh, summary statement, Laura. And uh, Raj, do you have a quick comment? Yes, I wanted to ask, uh, can, uh, this is, uh, Laura, do you think that voting can really change the system because uh, the two-party system is so entrenched. I really think that what you're doing is very valuable, is to fight, to present people-centric platform, uh, it, even if it is not all worker platform, but it's substantially worker platform, and uh, concerns of people about ecology and other things. So I think it's very valuable. But really, can do you expect this can actually change the system and uh, I think it's still worthwhile the struggle. Just question to you, uh, can the system be changed this way? Okay, that's an excellent thing. Laura, why don't you go ahead and respond to those two questions and have your summary statement and then we'll, we'll end. Okay, so th thanks in advance for a couple of extra minutes for the, uh, for the time. Um, and actually I can use um, Hugo Chavez in uh, Venezuela in 1999, uh, they had a fixed uh, two-party system. And it was actually something that was created at a place called Punto Fijo, which is fixed point. But they had a fixed two-party system. And he came in from outside that system to where the two parties ended up getting behind the same candidate to run against him. And it was because there was, that was the first time that I, I totally appreciated history. This happened, that happened, this happened, that happened, this happened. And then there was the time for Hugo Chavez. And um, people say that, oh, you uh, tell Venezuelans, we, you talk just like Hugo Chavez. And he says, no, she says, no, he talks like us. You know, because he was with the people. That's why he was so powerful and so popular and so charismatic, because he was with the people and he was he he was the real deal. He made mistakes, you know, he said said and did some stupid things, but he really was on the side of the people and he got voted into office. And Latin America has changed because he was voted into office and became the president of Venezuela and because he had studied so much history and he'd read so much and he'd read, you know, everything from Gandhi to everything else. And as you know, his story, he knew his history, he taught history in the military. He was from the military. And he knew that regional integration was extremely important. By yourself, you get nowhere. A country, a nation standing by itself doesn't get anywhere. But standing together, they have been able to push back the United States in a way over the in, in this millennium that they had not been able to in the 200 years of the um Monroe Doctrine, the backyard, you know, that Latin America. And so that has has given me some hope that things can change. And I know that things have changed in enrichment, as I've mentioned over and over, um, and think that things can change. Um, the U.S. is a hard nut to crack because we're so comfortable and so um, propagandized and not realizing that but we have freedom of speech. Yeah, well, we can say things and less and less. But um, ideology and, and principle, I don't know whether I should end on this note, but I'm sort of a lumper. I don't under, I don't get like people say, well, what kind of feminist are you? I, I, I don't get the differentiations. It's somehow my mind doesn't work that way. But um, the the ideology, I see, I don't know you, so you'd have to sort this out for me, but like the 10 key values are, there is no one person, no Marx person or something that we all go to, no Nader, no, you know, whatever. But that, but there are those values that somehow came together and that the, they're interlocking. And I put the, uh, in the chat, I put uh, a, a link to those 10 key values. And I mentioned the four pillars before, but in a, in a principle, and I don't know if this is a principle, but is no corporate money. You know, it's like we don't take corporate money. That's I see that as a commitment. And so you, to me, those things go to pull together 
and keep me aligned with the Green Party and, as I've said over and over, with the Peace and Freedom Party. Um, so, yeah, I'll take that as my uh, sum up. I do think like we need a huge social movement. Let's just snap our fingers and make that happen. We need that. And we need electoral politics and we need, you know, community gardens and we need, you know, cooperative babysitting, you know, we need all kinds of things, whatever calls your heart. That's what we need. Pull it together toward a better world where we're not um, putting other people down and where we're, you know, a world that works for everyone, a good old phrase, another world is possible, you know, but we need all of those things that whatever pulls our hearts, you know, um, go for that, do that toward a world that, uh, toward a better world. And. Okay. Well, thank you, Laura. Again, we're the, the, wonderful talk. I always appreciate your inspirational uh, and uh, attitude on this. So thank you so much. And thanks everybody for attending. We're going to uh, close down now, but uh, don't forget, come back next week, same time, uh, same Zoom link and join us for our talk. Hold, hold on a second. Uh, I just put yeah. my uh, email in the chat. If you want a copy of the chat, you can ask me for it. Thank you, Norma. Okay. Well, do I have everybody's permission to close the session here uh, electronically? I believe so. No, oh, oh. I'm blocking consensus. <laughs> uh, that only works in the green the page. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Propter Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609. Or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org. Don't worry.